in this I want to bring your mind into an area of great interest and it's mainly our present world we live in a world now obviously where in many people's mind everything has been done guess what they've been saying that for the past 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000, 10,000, 20,000 years man can only see as far as his limitations and if he cannot see any further than his limitations then nothing new will be brought into existence we also live in a compare or comparison culture now what do I mean by that? well a comparison culture means that I may be less focused on what I'm doing and what I'm about and I'm more focused on what you're about how you're dressed, how you look how you act, how you present yourself That is why I think many people nowadays have got such an identity crisis. Take the spiritual aspect out of um, our world and out of our life, and we actually have something that's a, a far greater problem than all of them. And the problem is how we have come and been brainwashed to see ourselves and see one another. Human beings have forgotten that they are essentially mud, that they are well-formed molecules <laughs> taken from the soil. And it's the soil that they will return once more. They, they like to have this air of superiority and you know, airs and graces about themselves. But they forget actually who and what they are. And like it or not, it doesn't matter whether you have a sex change, whether you identify as a transgender, whether you identify as a Muslim, a Sikh, a Hindu, a Christian, a white man, a black man, a white woman, black woman, yellow woman, pink woman, green woman, blue woman. Doesn't matter whether you label as a spoon, a tree, a fish, a flower, or a cat. It doesn't matter whether you come from England or deepest, darkest Africa. It doesn't matter if you come from America or the furthest reaches of out of space. Your physical presence is still nothing more than well-formed atoms and a cosmetic structure. <laughs> Remember, this is taking the spiritual aspect out of it. Otherwise, I would tell you you're a spiritual being having a temporary human experience. And what we found, actually, in a psychological sociology point of view, it sounds really big when you use these big words, isn't it? But basically what we found when we've studied how the world actually works is that human beings always want to be somewhere else, always want to be doing something else, and always want to be somebody else. Very few of them are ever happy where they're at. Very few of them are ever happy with the amount of money that they're earning. And very few of them are ever happy being themselves. So let's look at each one of these briefly in turn. For if you are ever happy where they're at, that is why there are so many people that love to travel the world. I know I did this uh, several years ago. Uh, my, my wife and I, our first holiday abroad, we went to Italy, Lake Garda, beautiful place. The food is absolutely incredible, although you need a second mortgage if you're going to eat out a lot of the time. So it can be very expensive. Um, much like the weather that we're having today in, in Britain and in the UK, you know, Lake Garda is, is simply phenomenal and I would very, very easily move and live there. And I spent a great portion of my life, you know, wanting to be somewhere else. If I was in England, I wanted to be in America. If I was in America, I wanted to be in Canada. If I wanted to be in Canada, I wanted to be in Scotland. If I wanted to be in Scotland, I want to be in Italy. If I want to be in Italy, well, if I've been in Italy, then I probably wouldn't want to be anywhere else. But the, you see what I mean? We're always looking for something else. We are designed to grow, we are designed to expand, and we are designed to, to experience life. And that's fine. But that brings us to the next point. We're never happy where we're at, in business or with what we are. Human beings have been conditioned for a long time now to 
want more. And it's a fool's game. Now you can have more, you can be better than what you are. But they go hand in hand. In order to get more, you've got to be better than what you were. So you've got to study more, you've got to learn more, and then you've got to learn how to implement what you've learned. So it becomes very convoluted and very messy. But you listen to a lot of these at one time very well-meaning life coaches and business so-called experts and gurus and all these guys and you listen to the way that they talk and uh, you know you've got to have more money you've got to have more peace you've got to have more joy you've got to have this and I sit and listen and I, I, I in fact I, I listen to them no I hear them I don't listen to them hearing and listening are two very different things I can hear what you see but listening means I absorb it so, I listen to a lot of them, and the reason that I say that at one time they were very well-intentioned people is because now I really, really question, because I see so many of them coming so aggressively, so angrily, so frustratedly, and quite honestly, they're not very pleasant creatures. <laughs> And I'm not going to speak badly or anything about them, that's, that's up to them, you know. Again, the, the life coaching industry is, is gone in many ways, much like the church, it's actually replaced it. And many people in that sect would say that uh, the, the life coaching industry is, is the new church. You know, that's, that's free of religion and free of boundaries and free of everything. Well, you know what happens to children if they don't have boundaries. Children like boundaries. Human beings like boundaries. They just don't want to know that they're there. So you've got the inmates running the show. And they're constantly telling you, you need more, you need more, you're not satisfied. And they're doing this so they can sell you their products. Because that is what they believe, and quite frankly, what has become a very sad, pathetic existence. And that's the only reason that they live, is because, you know, and they get up every morning telling you, you need to be better, you need to be better. And inside, maybe it's them that needs to be better. Maybe it's them that actually needs to take a cold, hard look at themselves. I, I want to finish on a, on a very specific point here momentarily, so, so just remind me. Um, because... Uh, I don't know about you, but I'm seeing a lot of causes and a lot of things, and I'll talk about that momentarily. So, so as I don't get sidetracked, so, so you listen, or you hear this industry that's, that's constantly screaming and shouting and things, and my general rule for any of you that know me and have known me for a long time is anyone that screams and shouts at me, I don't listen. And I certainly don't buy their products. Nor do I buy into what they're selling. And then I've got the comparison industry, which says, you know... you're better than me, or I'm better than you, or you dress finer than I do, or I dress finer than you do, again, because we are looking at it from a physical point of view, we're looking at the cosmetic, the atomic structure, the DNA genetic setup, and we're not actually looking at it from the spirit. Some very beautiful looking people are some of the most unkind people on the face of the planet. You know, Hitler wasn't a, a particularly ugly man, he wasn't a particularly bad looking man, neither was Putin. Neither was Kim Jong-un, neither was uh, Attila the Hun, neither was uh, Alfred the Great, um, William the Conqueror, um, Stalin, you know, Bloody Mary. None of these people were particularly ugly people on the external, but on the internal they were foul and deceitful. Just vile. Because they were always looking from the external. And their inner engineering, their inner place of being had become so corrupt. But what we've got now is this comparison culture which says, you know, if if I do a podcast um, my way, then you should follow suit. Or if you do a podcast your way, I should follow suit because you're doing it right and you can speak, you know, faster and louder and, and more charismatically than I can. Or I can do exactly the same, but for my show. 
and people then want to change. And, and what I've found actually is that the, the less that I listen to people, the more I become myself. And that is why um, certain sects and certain religions around the world, uh, you know, in order for people to find themselves, will do one of two things. One, they will either go to a guru, if you're a Hindu or a, Bud or a Buddhist, um, they will go to a guru, a mentor, and they will spend maybe 20 years for two meetings per week. So you find yourself and you find what you want to do. And then there's another group of people within the same part of the world who will go into the forest. And there they will spend two years with no company, or no arranged company at least, and they literally will go and find themselves. Human beings now are having such an identity crisis because they have no idea who they are. They have forgotten that they are divine beings having a temporary human experience. They have forgotten in any mo moment that they can choose how their life uh, develops and shapes and pans and shifts and people will say to me well John that's complete nonsense I'm here to tell you that it is not you just got to be bold enough to go ahead and do it there is not a result or there is not a, uh, a resolve or there's not a, uh, an ability to do there's not a lack of ability to do what you want to do there's just sometimes a resolve to actually go out and do it and to be the person you want to be and because people don't believe fully that that can happen, that's why it never does. You know, what, what you believe will be your reality. And that's not some nice cliche or a nice little fanciful word or anything like that. That is a reality. If you believe things won't work out, guess what? They probably won't. If you believe you're going to get sick, guess what? The chances are you probably will. What you put into your head is going to manifest in one form or another, and I know that only too well. Um, today's um, seminar very nearly did not happen because of my own foolishness and my own, um, I suppose, unwillingness to take care fully of myself. And um, I ended up getting very, very sick on Friday afternoon. And I spent the next two or three days in bed. And it was only maybe Tuesday morning that I started to feel a little better. Wednesday I started to eat again properly. And it was all because someone had asked something. And this person who uh, has had a very checkered history with our family kind of sets my teeth on edge, quite honestly. But I allowed, I made the cardinal sin, <laughs> I allowed it, I allowed it to affect me, I got myself all worked up, all upset, and if you've ever worry, wondered if worry can kill you, let me tell you folks, yes it can, because I spent uh, nine months out of 20, I think it was 2020, um, either in bed, or with very little movement, because I had torn my midsection from just under my navel, all the way down uh, sorry, all the way, I'll try that again, from my breastbone all the way down to a navel. And this was pain that moved all around my back and here, there and everywhere. And it was chronic. I did not sleep more than 14 hours. If you ever wondered what your concern of other people will do to you, it can kill you. That's where ulcers come from. That's where colitis more often than not can come from. It all starts internally. It is as simple as that. And people can argue with me as much as they want. Trust me. Well, it's up to you whether you want to trust me or not. The outer expression will always reflect the inner workings. So we live in this comparison culture, to get back on point, where people believe that they have to have more, people believe that they're not enough, people believe what other people tell them. You know what I do when anybody comes with that kind of an attitude of me? Block. People don't speak to me face to face these days, I make sure of that. And uh, the majority of people don't even have access to my phone number. If I don't recognize a phone number, I'm not even going to answer it. I barely answer the ones that I do recognize. <laughs> so, so, thought that would get a, a giggle. So what happens is we've got this comparison culture and, and you know, in, in teenagers, it gets worse and worse and worse because this is what's programmed into the world. Our world is a reflection of a global state of mind. <laughs> a state of mind that is toxic and cancerous. It is not sustaining. 
It is dying. And the point that I was going to make several moments ago, which I'm going to make now so it doesn't leave my head, is I'm seeing more and more people fighting for more and more causes, going to more and more wars, getting sicker and sicker and sicker, putting more and more issue upon the National Health Service and hospitals around the world, medical centres and things like that. And more and more strikes going on for teachers who are, quite frankly, already earning a lot of money. But they believe that they're not earning nearly enough. Now, I know that's a really sensitive thing, but I'm going to be very bold and say this. When you are earning thirty-five to 40000 a year, or 28000 to 40000 a year, which many teachers around the world, or certainly here in the UK, are, um, stop complaining. Okay? Because there are people that are surviving on a fraction of that. Now, you may say, yeah, but John, what's expected of us... Is, um, is, is, is is just completely and utterly beyond fathom. Yes, and I completely agree with that. What is expected for 28000 a year? You know, I've known teachers that start at 6 o'clock in the morning and don't finish until 10 o'clock at night. Well, guess what? Here's what you can do. If you don't like doing the reports, don't do them. Oh, but my boss, my boss, my boss, my boss. Guess what? If people, and enough people, and this goes for all of the things around the world that people are struggling with right now, if enough people stop doing the reports and stop filing in the garbage and stop bowing down to this invisible governing body that chances are doesn't even read the reports because if they did things probably wouldn't be in the state that they're in and if they do then they should be fired for the things being in the state that they're in but if enough people actually turn around and say no we're not doing these reports we're not doing these initiatives we're here to teach what we know. We're here to see the kids through school, provide the best education we can for them, and to send them on the way into the working world. That is your job as a teacher. And if enough of you turn around and say, we are not filling in these reports, we're not doing work after six o'clock, then guess what? The world will either completely fire you, but my guess, more likely, is they'd realize, wait a second, we can do something about this. We can make your working life a bit easier. Again, it goes back to the whole thing. You create your culture. If you're not happy with it, change it. But don't complain about it. <sighs> so I'm seeing more and more initiatives, more and more ideas, more and more causes, more and more charities, more and more businesses, more and more people complaining, more and more people you know, telling me what I should do and what I shouldn't do. I'm seeing more and more people doing this and doing that and doing the other. More and more people going to war. More and more and more and more and more and more and more. To the point it gets exhausting. And I want to say to 8.6 billion people on the planet, stop! Just for a minute. And just be. Because when you realize you are nothing but dust, you are nothing but well-formed molecules out of the cosmos. And what you do really does not matter eternally. In the slightest. All those problems you're feeling, you can't see if you look at the Earth from the moon. All the things you're experiencing in 300 billion trillion years from now won't even be in existence. <laughs> so for goodness sake, just stop. But some people may say, well, John, you know, how could you say that? Our cause is really important and our cause is this. Well, let, let, let's examine it, shall we? People are now, and I'll, I'll finish with this because I'm aware that time is, is disappearing. People are now fighting for global change. They've actually been fighting for global efforts now, I think, since the 1800s, when a lot of these problems first began. Obviously on a much mass, much more massive scale now, I think. It certainly was in the turn of the century, and, and by the 1920s, 30s, 40s, um, it was in, you know, uh, a much grander scale. So, We experienced the weather 
and the conditions 40 years after the change has taken place. So what happens is all of that garbage that was pumped up into the ether from carbon emissions back in the 1970s is now the effect that we are seeing here in 2022. So, here's the thing. It is going to take at least 20 years before we see the weather effects from the 1990s. Which means, folks, we have got some tough times ahead. Now, I've got to be honest with you. I don't know that the world can be saved. And equally, I don't know if the majority of the world wants to be saved. It seems to be doing a pretty good job of, of destroying itself on a daily basis. But if it can be saved, and there is a chance, then I firmly believe it is a cause worth fighting for. Hunger, starvation, barren plains are all as much of the divine plan as our desire to change it. And these things come forth to give an opportunity to change. In uh, our next lecture, one of the things that I do want to touch on is why the energy companies should be really worried right now. Because they're charging such a high price and there's so much inflation going on around the world and and a lot of people are really worried and frantic and everything. Guess what? This isn't a new thing. And this is a time of phenomenal opportunity. Why? Because whenever great hardship and the balance of power is tipped too far in the favor of the rich, what happens is that people start becoming creative and innovative. And they start saying, how can we do things differently? What can we do that would make a difference? And you might find within our lifetime that gas, oil, petrol disappear from the list of an energy resource or are greatly reduced and are, are replaced by wind turbines, by solar panels, by all the things that happen naturally. And no doubt the energy companies will find a way to exploit it and take a economic percentage and cut and all of that kind of stuff. But people become innovative, they become creative, and I think more and more than ever, that's what human beings are looking for now. If you've ever wondered why artists such as Michelangelo, Raphael, Vincent van Gogh, and Da Vinci have lasted the tale of time. I believe it's for multiple reasons, but I believe one in particular. It's because they didn't look around and say, I want to be somewhere else. I want to do something else. Or I want to be somebody else. They simply said, I have been brought into this world as I am. divine perfection, beauty and all in this fleshly form. And people may criticize that. And I say, well, what's the alternative? You can either believe you're amazing or you can believe you're a big bowl of garbage. Me personally, I believe I'm amazing. And then look at the difference and how the lives play out. But those aforementioned gentlemen lived out their own Calling. They lived out their own life, not in the least bit interested as to what other people were comparing them to or other people were saying. So the next time you feel yourself feeling worried or concerned about what other people think and what other people do, just remember they're a big ball of dust. I was going to go with a big ball of dirt, but uh, I'm very much aware that that has different connotations around the world. So a big ball of dust. 
From dust they came, to dust they will go. And it doesn't matter how powerful they think they are. If they didn't have the money, they wouldn't have one iota of power. You want to know where the power goes? Just watch the money trail. You want to know where the power goes? Watch where the money flows. That's the only reason that they've got power. It's because they've bought it. And they figured out how to make money. Figure out how to make money and make your own power. If that's what you seek. It's not that difficult once you actually figure it out. Income streams and asset building. But the deeper thing that we're talking about here today is realize and remember who you are. And you don't have to be like the flock. That was the whole story and the whole purpose of my painting, The Red Blossom Tree. It's the people who are unique and different, who speak in a different tongue, a different way, with a different attitude that stand out. They last the test of time. Whenever I'm doing coaching, I get asked about this name and that name and the other name. And the majority of them, I have to turn around and say, well, I'm sorry, but I've never heard of them. They've not even crossed my radar in the slightest. Oh, well, they're really good. Well, I'm sure they are really good. But out of 8.6 billion people, you know, that's, that's a lot of people that I've got to meet and greet. Don't compare yourself to others because guess what? They're not you and they weren't made to be you and you weren't made to be them. If they were them, then you would be them and you would be them and you'd stop being you. And it's the divine you that is here and now that is helping somebody else that is here for a purpose, that is here for a reason. So stop trying to be somebody else and fulfilling someone else's dharma and someone else's plan and and reason for being. Something you'll never be able to do because it wasn't designed for you. But always remember, the next time somebody has a go at you, the next time someone speaks unkindly to you, just remember they're a big ball of dust. And life flows much easier that way. Namaste, my friends. God bless. Friends, God bless.